From the moment that I heard that MSL was going to join us on the stage, I have been anticipating this talk because as a woman, I'm really curious around the title, Let My Vagina Speak, From the Bedroom to the Boardroom. But beyond that, I'm really curious about her as a human being because she's a mother, she's an entrepreneur who started many businesses, but also she started an organization and a platform for women to understand their femininity in a way that I can't even yet comprehend. So as we hear from her experience, I know that I'm gonna have a ton of questions, but the one thing that I can say about Emma in briefly meeting her is she embodies everything that she talks about. From the moment I met her, the first thing that she did was hug me, but also just exudes a bunch of feminine power and energy and warmth. And I am really excited to welcome Emma to the stage. Emma, please come join us. Listen to me now. Uh, I'm hugging again. <laughs> I'm a hugger. Huh? What do I, what do I need that for? Listen, listen to me now. <laughs> I'm not doing any slides. And the last time I got given one of those tickets in a talk, I kept thinking it was a microphone. So I kept holding it up until someone said, that's not the microphone, that's the ticker. So if she puts that in my hand now, it's going to get really confusing. So it's much easier. Um, yeah, I'm a hugger. I'm British and a hugger, which makes me a really rare breed, according to Meghan Markle. Um, so um, also, hadn't realized I was going to be on the really, really big stage um, and walked in this morning to try and find the personal growth stage, walked through this one where it's not going to be that one, carried on walking, asked where it was, and got pointed back here. And I think my reaction to that is pretty much one that a lot of women and a lot of girls have, and actually will bring me on to the start of my whole journey with killing kittens. It's that reaction of, why the fuck am I on the big stage with all the experts who know that what they're talking about? Why would I be on there? Why would anyone have any interest in listening to me who doesn't have many qualifications? I've got a degree in sports science. That does a lot for sex. Um, and, and then I put on my big girl pants, slapped myself around a bit, and went, I'm going to get on that stage. I don't care if anyone likes me. I'm not going to put my big girl heels on. I'm going to keep my flip-flops on. And I'm going to flip-flop around the stage talking about my story. And I think... Thank you. And I think that part of that is, at what point do we... I've got a four-year-old and a six-year-old girl. I've got a boy as well. Who, and the four-year-old and six-year-old couldn't be more confident and feisty. And I look at them sometimes and I think, at what point do we, as girls, lose that confidence and the feistiness? And they are way more feisty than my son. At what point does, do we start listening to the world and that world saying, you've got to be this, you've got to be that, be a good girl, keep your legs crossed, you can't do that, only boys can do that. And I think, so the beginning of my story, it wasn't a light bulb moment, age 26, that suddenly I woke up one morning and went, do you know what I'm going to do? Organize orgies, that's it. That's the light bulb moment. It wasn't that. It was a feisty little tiny girl who grew up with a pretty shitty dad, um, military, moving all over the world, um, and just watching and questioning everything, and wanting to be a boy, and having all my hair cut off, wanting to do loads of sport, um, climbing trees, and every time someone said, you can't do that, you're a girl, that's what boys do, I'd go, watch me. I started playing the trombone when I was eight, because no one else in the school played it, but apparently it was a boy's instrument. I didn't want to play it, I just played it. I can still play it, I'm really good at it. it um, that's probably more you know, helpful in the sex world than sports science degree, to be honest. Um, so anyway, so I grew up in the Middle East. I went to an all-girls boarding school at the same time. So I had these mixed messages of one minute in the Middle East watching the wives walk, walk behind their husbands, all covered up, and, you know, know your place. And also being at home, which was very much mum had to know her place and dad was very emotionally abusive and had a real temper on him, seeing that, but then being at an all-girls boarding school between the age of eight and 18, 
where I was told, well, A, that all, I believed all boys were over six foot, so that was a huge disappointment when I came out at 18. But believing that I could, the world was equal, and I could be whatever I wanted to be, and I could go into whatever job I wanted. And so you didn't, I didn't get that message at school that there was any difference between boys and girls. I then came out into the real world, um, and the dating world, and my, so the hormones kick in, so you start noticing boys. You start noticing, actually, rather than, well, if they're climbing trees, I want to climb trees. And, you know, if they're playing the trombone, I want to play the trombone. It became, hang on a minute, they can snog who the hell they want, they can do what they want, they can brag about it to their mates, they can have one-night stands, but God forbid you as a girl, you know, snog loads of boys in one night or even snogged girls. You know what I mean? Back then, you know, this was, I, I'm 45, so it's, the world's got a little bit better <laughs> since then. But it was, I remember being at university, and if you got naked one night with a boy, you know, you did everything but. Because if you had sex, you were a slut. So you could give as many blowjobs as you wanted, but you couldn't have sex. And looking at that, looking back at that, you think, that's crazy. How? How does that mindset get in our heads, that shame and that guilt of you can literally get naked, let a guy touch any bit of you, do anything to you, have any bit of their anatomy, you know, in your mouth, but in a vagina, that's it, you're slut shame, you're dead to any man out there, you're not girlfriend material. And that was a bit, I was out early 20s and the amount of guys, friends of mine, would be talking about a girl I met an amazing girl, but she's not girlfriend material. I'd be like, well, why is she not girlfriend material? Well, she just slept with loads of boys. And I'd sit there and go, and you slept with loads of girls, so are you not boyfriend material? So it kind of, there was this fire in my belly that had just kept raging and raging and raging. And I went into my first job working in the city, all like gung-ho, thinking this is it, equal world, going into work in the city, week one, boss tried it on with me. Moved me around to sit next to him, hand on thigh, everything, and it kept going and going. And I, I complained gently, I was only like 21 to start with, then made a formal complaint to HR, and basically got told I'd be a troublemaker. Did I want to do a proper official complaint? Because word travels fast in the city, and I wouldn't be very unemployable, or did I just want to leave quietly? So I stupidly, little insecure 22-year-old left quietly. Um, and then I sort of carried on in entertainment PR. Again, really disheartened, because every, you know, just trying to be equal, trying to be in a world and going, well, I can do it. If they can do it, I can do it. And I found myself doing, helping do the PR for the Erotica show, which was this big sort of sex trade exhibition um, in London, which had everything from lingerie, porn, sex toy companies, anything to do with the adult world was in there. And I met some weird and crazy wonderful people. But again, that fire in my belly was like, hang on a minute, that's a lingerie brand. It's designed by men, it's owned by a man, that's a sex toy company. Those are vibrators. They're designed by an all-male team is owned by men. So as you can see, that fire is really getting me pissed off now. So it kept, so then just doing all that, and at the same time, I was out and about in London with quite a crazy group that a lot of Brits know of women. The women are very well known, they're in their 50s now, and what I saw them get up to in parties, and they just slept with anyone and everyone, and they just owned it, and they were the most amazing creatures I've ever seen in my life. And I was just watching and thinking this whole, this whole world, everything from going out to bars and clubs and being on edge, walking across the dance floor because I'd get hands up my skirts and having to walk home with my key in my, in a, a lot of you girls in the audience have probably done this, where you walk home with your door key, lodged in like that, and it has to have the spiky bit upwards so that if a guy comes near you, you go and that's it, spiky bit across the face. How many men in there know a lot of girls do that in here? Probably there's lots of men that don't realize we do that. So they, I don't do it so much now. As I said, I'm 45, and there's not many people that would jump me in an alleyway. So, um, although they would, wearing heels and, you know, a short skirt. I've got good legs. Um, so anyway, we, 
it just had that, and we went to this wedding in Ibiza, um, and there was 40 of us, and it was all the crazy lot, the London lot, and the things they got up to in this wedding, and we hadn't slept for about three days, and we just all sat around, and somebody who couldn't make the wedding phoned in and said, what are you all doing? You just sat around killing kittens at the moment. We were like, well, what's that? And it's, it's slang for every time you masturbate, God kills a kitten. Again, how many of you knew that? Not many. There aren't many people who ever ask me why a business is called Killing Kittens, which I find disturbing, to be honest. Um, and so it's slang. So she just said, you know, sort of meant are you guys just all, are you all just sat around sort of playing with each other? And I went, that's it. Loved the name. I went, I want to create a space and a world, online and offline, where, that flips society on its norm when it comes to sexuality. With women in control, they make the first move. They're the ones in control. They're the ones who's empowered. They can explore their sexuality without any shame, any judgment. They can ask questions. They can find like-minded individuals. Because also at the time, you, as a girl, even your closest group of girlfriends, a lot of people wouldn't, a lot of girls wouldn't be honest with what they were really thinking. And, and actually, scientifically, girls are bicurious. Most of you might not have known that either. Like scientifically, as animals, women, four, on the sexuality scale, three, four, five. Scale of one to seven. We have vets, why we're more touchy-feely. I mean, I hug, you know, Sam, never met her before in my life. I've hugged her twice now. You know, we, it's how we are. We check out girls faster than men check out girls. I have this competition with my husband. So, you know, any girl that gets shitty with her, you know, their other half checking out girls walking past them. You've checked them out quicker than they have, love. So let's be honest with yourself. So launched, uh, well, what started as an event company with underground parties, with a small online base and a small all online community to start with back in 2005. And it's just, it grew and grew and it's grown and it's grown. And the online side sort of took over and in 2015 sort of looked at the business, and there was four of us very offline, we like people and hugging people, going, hang on a minute, half, over half our revenue is actually coming from the online digital side. So at that time, 2015, you know, Me Too was coming in after that, Trump came in, there was this reignited sort of fire in the belly of sort of world females. Um, and I just went, this is it, this, if we don't get investment on board now, if I don't get someone who really knows what they're doing on the digital front, to launch in and take this and run with it, then some Silicon Valley upstart with millions in the bank is going to come flying over the top of me and launch a platform claiming to own female sexuality. So, because that's what's happened in every other industry. And so, that's what we did. So I got, and that was hard, and that is, that's a big lesson I've learned on the way is when to let go, when to, when it's your baby, when you've launched something, and to realize you're not good at everything. I am shit at so much stuff. And the minute I realized that and accepted that, and you start bringing in people and the team members, and we have a whole online tech team, and I have nothing to do with them. I sit there bored sometimes, and especially in COVID, you know, there was, I've just, I, t I said, I'm gonna have to bench myself. And being a sports nut, I often, use, I'm big on sports psychology, I often think in very sports psychology, times of you're playing a whole team and you need so many different individuals. And if you look at a football team, you know, a goalkeeper is not the same size or shape as a striker. They're very different. They play in very different capacities. And I think that was another lesson is, 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 is basically the team of people, well, I call it a very eclectic, you know, dysfunctional family. It's completely, everyone's completely different, but they all play in different spaces. And I totally benched myself because we had 18 months of all, all digital. Um, and then we've built, we've raised over, we raised over 200, 2 million pounds in the last three years um, and built this whole new all singing, dancing, social dating, sex positive platform that incorporates sex education, community, chat groups, um, you name it, it's all in there. And that again was very hard last year, having had the name Killing Kittens for 17 years, and that, I call it like the teenage child, that was my baby, is making the decision last summer to split the business, to rebrand as two separate companies and move the entire online digital world into another 
another company which we launched in April called WeRx. And that's been really difficult because when your whole identity in life is wrapped up in, in a brand and a name, um, suddenly moving. And we've done it because the world is very different. It's not, Killing Kittens is very female. It's very, well, it's female centric. It's female at the core. It's female driving it. And, you know, stats came out this week, a big UN report saying that actually equality has gone down in the last decade. That whole, you know, we're doing way better, it hasn't. The stats are horrific. I was reading them this morning on that front. So, but then the online side, we're living in a thousand shades of gender and sexuality, and, and so we wanted an all-inclusive platform. So that's, that's basically the business side um, in a nutshell. And it's very hard when you get told you've got 20 minutes <laughs> to, put that, to put 18 years with so many different lessons um, in the 18 years into, into 20 minutes. Um, but one big thing I've learned, and it's why as I start, you know, I started this saying, went, fuck it, I'm going to stand on the stage, I'm not going to wear my heels. That was, that was the big thing. That was the big thing in my 20s when you stop giving a shit. And I think as women, we give too many shits about what people think about you, worried about being the perfect person, worried about being the perfect wife, being the perfect mother, being the perfect friend, or doing the right thing. It's, you know, we're constantly constantly looking outward at not upsetting people of, well, what will they think? What will they think? When you can be what I call unapologetically selfish, and I do that, and I go, I'm a mom of three, and I run this crazy business, and I've never taken a maternity day in my life because I haven't been able to, and I feel guilty. Whatever I do, I feel guilty. Am I giving my husband enough attention? Probably not. Am I giving my kids enough attention? Probably not. Am I working enough, hard enough? Probably not. Nothing I do in my head will be, will be perfect, will, will be right. Whichever way I look at things, I, will feel, I feel guilty that I have come to accept that and made peace with it, and I'm now in just, fuck it. I'm selfish, you know, and unapologetically selfish in that I have an amazing team around me of people. I have a, built a tribe and a village around me at home. I'm out here, abroad, for two nights. This is like a holiday for me, leaving an eight-year-old, six-year-old, and a four-year-old at home with their father having to not babysit, which took him five years to change the term babysit to parenting, to parent, and not worry about it, and not go, shit, is he going to be all right? I've gone, he's a parent. He'll be fine. And that's, you know, another thing you feel guilty about is, we, should, you know, should I be leaving them? Is he going to be all right? Well, we're all right. He left me for a month last year to play cricket in India. Did he at any point organize anything while he was away or check in to make sure the kids had packed lunches, the school bags were done, and the, book, and the books were read? No, he fucking didn't. So why should I do that being away for three days? So that, that sort of... It comes to kind of just wrapping it up quickly, because we've got to be quick um, in, these, in these things. I could ramble on for hours. Um, is that I look at that as success. That there's so many, I've seen there's a lot of young people here today, which is amazing, and just hungry, and hungry to start their own businesses and be inspired or find their passion and their purpose and to get out there and smash life. And you'll be being fed a lot of messages about what success is, and it's money, and it's big houses, and it's lifestyle. And at the same time, with girls fed, well, I've got to find a husband, I've got to have kids, I've got to, or, you know, it's sort of the, everything, all of that. And one thing I've made peace with as well, and people often ask me, what, what, do you, how do you define success? What's your biggest success? My biggest success is being able to pick my kids up at three o'clock in the afternoon, being able to go and see a school match at 11 o'clock on a Tuesday, on a weekday, to not miss anything going on in their lives whilst having launched four businesses and having an amazing teams run those businesses. I might not live in a massive house. I wish. We're still raising money. I'm a classic poor entrepreneur, cash-strapped. Um, my, you know, I live in a massive house. I'm, I earn OK money. We have you know, a couple of holidays very kind of all-inclusive childcare, cheap holidays with the kids a year. We live on a river, so that's the holiday for them. They can swim in that, get covered in crap. Um, so that, that, that's 
to me, is success, is finding that balance. And the thing that I'm the most proud of, and I think as women, you have to ask yourself, just as you, what, what success to you? Because I tell you what, it won't, it won't be what you've been told to believe is success. Um, so yeah, I've got to finish there, otherwise I could carry on for hours. It says 10 minutes on the timer. <laughs> It'd be nice, oh, there we go. I was gonna say, if you'd like another minute or two to add, um, but what I was gonna say to you is I wanna challenge you on something. Okay. Um, because you said that you've always been challenging and you've had this heat and this fire in you, which I can totally feel, and at least what I take away from what you've said is you're not selfish. You just take who you are and you own it, and I really appreciate that, because for me as a woman, that's inspirational around all those things that we define ourselves around what we should be, but maybe we don't have to be. Yeah. So thank you for sharing that with That's us. Okay. And I'm sure there's probably a ton of questions and we already have one. So over to you. Yes, hello, uh, great speech, thank you. My question to you as an expert is, what do you think of modern platforms like OnlyFans, for example? Do you think this is like benefiting the over-sexualizing women to like weakening their power? Or is it like a powerful tool to benefit with their sexuality? Um, personally, and I think this is where we're in a really, we're in a really muddled world when it comes to feminism and what is a feminist. And you get, I see a lot of women bashing only fans, they bash strippers, they bash high-end prostitutes. Uh, and to me, to me, being a feminist is having that freedom and choice to be completely in control with your choices and what you do and what you do for a living. And, and a lot, I know some OnlyFam girls, and they are bossing it, owning it. I think with any kind of tech platform, you're going to have the really wrong end of it. You've got the, you know, there is trafficking. You've got that, but you've got that on all sites. I mean, look what's just happened with Instagram. Massive pedophile, pedophile ring smashed using, I can't remember what it is. I can't, can you remember? I can't remember, they were doing something very simple um, and to get past, get past it using Instagram. They've had the same thing in like Facebook chat groups, you know, so it, I think where, there, where there's a will, there's a way. Um, and but only fans as a whole, if that gives them independent, financial independence, then they're totally in control, and they're owning it, and they're safe behind screens. They're, you know, giving footage that people pay for. Um, so be it, as far as I'm concerned. That, that, um, I'm, I'm all for it, really. <laughs> all right, thank you so much. We've got a question over here and then over there. That was a great, um, thank you. So where's the question? Oh, I'm oh, sorry. I was like, where are you? Oh yeah. Um, I re resonated a lot with your story, and always thought as a mom that I would ha picture having two girls and I would raise them to be <laughs> a person like yourself. And then I got two boys. Then you met me. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm wondering because you said you have a son too. I feel like as a empowered female, female identifying person, I know what I would know. I know how to raise that person. But I'm curious what your perspective is on how we raise boys to create the world that we're talking about for women, and what's that? Got you. And I think, and do you know what? I actually worry about, I worry about my son more than I worry about the girls. And because his confidence and shyness, and he needs a lot more hand-holding. But what I, do, what I do with him, and I say it straight, is, is that consent and the boundaries and the respect and also... You know, you might, people might get a bit queasy in here. Like, he walked in last year and I was changing a tampon. And rather than, he was like, what's that? We had a conversation. And it wasn't very ad adult. It was like, oh, well, girls, bigger girls, you know, once a month. It helps with babies and, and actually your body. And she, he went, well, Lily and MJ bleed every month when they're, like, bigger. And I said, yeah, they will. But and he was like, oh, okay. Just walked out of the bathroom. It's that that I try and just normalize so that I want him to be that boy that doesn't stand there and laugh if a classmate is, you know, you can see they've bled in their pants type thing, or, or tell boys that they're being out of order and you can't treat, treat girls um, like that. So, and it, you know, I, one of my pr great proud moments last month, they've just started doing body parts, 
and um, they were doing their, these are breasts, this is a penis, this is, and apparently the teacher told me that all the boys started laughing when she said breasts, and he turned around and went, it's just a body part, because all, every, every, I'm just wandering around naked, and whenever he laughs, I'm like, they're just boobs, Raph, it's like your elbow, your kneecap, your boobs, it's a body part, so to hear that actually he had told his other eight, eight-year-old boys in his class to shut up, it's just a body part, it's, it's that, that, you know what I mean, I'm not going to be perfect, but it's sort of just normalizing and making him realize that, and the girls are really sporty and do loads of sport too, so he's already kind of going, well, girls can do football. So it's that kind of bit that I try and do. I want to ask you a question before we move to the individual over there, and then we've got a question there, just around, um, I'm going to say, having more conversations and putting sexuality on the table. Because there's a room full of people here who obviously wanted to hear about how, like sexuality and how do you bring that to the forefront. You've got an online platform, but I find it's still not something we really talk about, especially as women. So any suggestions or tips on how we can do that and how we can bring it more to the forefront of our everyday well, that, conversations? Yeah, a big and one reason why we have split the business and made the online platform all inclusive is because I just really, I, our main thing is to normalize sex, normalize the conversations, normalize, because I'm like, your sexuality, we're animals, and our sexuality drives us more than anything else, more than religion, more than politics, more just more than anything. It's the core of who we are as animals, and I think the suppression of it has, caused, has basically caused all the world's fuck-ups. Um, so it's sort of, if you can really look into your core and learn what really makes you tick, and what, you know, as a couple as well, makes, you know, have real open conversations, and, and as individuals, you know, have, especially, and, you know, as girls, as guys, of like, are we really straight? or are we bi, or, you know, actually be really open and honest with yourselves. And I just think you, it brings out the better person. It being, if, you're, if you have the confidence in the bedroom, you're going to have it in the boardroom. And until you're really your true sexual being, how can you be your real true self everywhere Love else? Love that. Be authentic <laughs> in your sex life as yeah. well. <laughs> Over to you. Me? Okay. Um, I already got a lot of answers on, um, on my question with what you said before. What I wanted to ask, um, I did some research on how sex education for the kids in our society could have, uh, should be done in order to make it right. And there was like a phrase, um, the smaller the kid is, the shorter the, que the answer should be on the question it has on sex, for example. From a practical point of view, to empower, uh, empower um, our girls, for example, focusing on the girls. What um, tips do you have, like, regarding um, sexual education? Um, and we'll, my, I mean, for one thing, my four-year-old says vagina on point now. She yelled at it the other day. They were playing, like, chase, and you had to, you can only get caught if you touch. She's like, no, you didn't get me. You've got to get me from my neck to my vagina, she yelled across the playground. And I was there going... Okay, am I going to be judged as a mum? But part of that is, and again, there's studies on that, is actually a lot of sexual abuse doesn't get picked up or because if a child can't name the body part, or it's like, they've touched my bum, well, where, you know what I mean? It's like, if they can just, they can pinpoint, and, you know, properly, that. It's, so it's, and as I said, they're body parts. So I think I'm all into, like, short answers and very age-appropriate answers. But to me, what is the point of, of get, oh, it's your secret special place and giving it like a crazy name when it's a vagina? <laughs> so um, how is that going to help you in later life uh, if people think, oh, it's, it's a dirty, shameful, seedy place? That doesn't help with the shame and the guilt that then gets your me ingrained in you as you get older. So that's, that's me personally. <laughs> Thank you. We might have time for one more question, if there's any. Yes, we've got a qu another question over here. Uh, yes, since you uh, spoke about the guilt and the shame with uh, women with the like vagina intersexuality, what is your biggest advice, advice on how to get over this shame? Um, my biggest, well, the biggest advice is that 
is that actually pinpoint where the shame comes from. Because when I have conversations and people, you know, I've always had loads of abuse to what I do, go, it's disgusting. I'm like, why is it disgusting? Which, which bit is disgusting? What's shameful? If you actually, but you can have the conversation with yourself. Like, why do I think it's shameful? Why? Because not many people can tell you why they think it. It's because we've had the, such strong messaging since we were little from society and culture telling us it's shameful and seedy and dirty and wrong that that you automatically go, it's, it's seedy, it's disgusting. And so if you actually ask yourself, why is it? If you very quickly end up with, well, it's not. <laughs> so you know, it's kind of, no one can give me that answer as to why sex is, you know, seedy or disgusting or dirty or, um, so yeah, I think it, well, yeah, I think if you feel shame or guilt about anything, if you really question why, where that's coming from, you get to the bottom of it pretty, pretty quickly. Thank you. All right, thank Amazing. you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here today. And I love that last part around asking yourself why and also asking yourself, is it true? Because most of the time it's made up bullshit yeah. that we've heard the stories and as you started off with, the stories that we've told ourselves. And I challenge all of you to break through the conventions and challenge those things that you believe are true.